everyone. We're going to go over chapter 13, which is known as the central dogma of molecular biology. This is one of the most important chapters of the whole class. So uh, this is divided into three sections, 13.1, 13.2, and 13.3. Um, so let's get into 13.1, which is just about the central dogma of molecular biology. There are three steps within the central dogma of molecular biology. They are replication, transcription, and translation. We already went over trans, or uh, sorry, we already went over replication, which was last week when we were in chapter 12, but that's basically where DNA is going to copy itself. The second step of the central dogma is going from DNA to RNA. That's called transcription. The last step is known as translation. That's using that RNA to make a protein. This is how your DNA is going to code and make what you look like the way that you are. Remember that your 50% at least of just protein. Um, we talked about proteins a little bit in chapter two when we talked about macromolecules, but basically your proteins give you the characteristics that you are. So why are you six foot tall? Why are you, you know, why do you have I don't, I, a certain color hair, a certain color eyes? It's because of the proteins in your body. Okay, so one of the things we have to know with the central dogma is the difference between DNA and RNA. DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. RNA is ribonucleic acid. And there are three main differences. The first difference is that we use ribose instead of the sugar deoxyribose. Um, this is just, a, you can see the end here is ose. That just means it's a sugar. So it's just a different type of sugar. The second difference is that uh, RNA contains uracil instead of thymine. So you can see here, this is RNA. We have cytosine, guanine, adenine, and instead of thymine, we have a nucleotide called uracil. It's almost identical. However, it is different. Um, so again, C, G, A, U. All the nucleotides are the same except thymine, which is replaced with uracil. And lastly, it's a single strand. You can see this is a single strand, not a double strand. I'll show you what that kind of looks like in the next image. You can see on this side we have DNA. It's double-stranded and has cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thymine, while RNA is single-stranded, which has C, G, A, and U. All right, so transcription. The process is... Uh, ooh, let me go back here. The process of transcription, come on, go back. There we go. The process of transcription is pretty easy um, compared to like replication. There were a lot of working parts in replication, but transcription is actually pretty easy. So transcription, this occurs in the nucleus, and this is when an enzyme called RNA polymerase is going to unzip and copy the DNA, making something called mRNA. This is RNA polymerase in the image. You can see the uh, RNA polymerase is using DNA to make an exact copy of that DNA. It's gonna use something called the template strand, which is this bottom strand here, to make the strand of RNA. Now this RNA strand is gonna be exactly like the coding strand, which I'm not gonna make, make you know, but I'm just showing you that we have names for these different types of strands. Understand that the mRNA that we're talking about here, it's just a copy of DNA. I'll give you an analogy for a lot of these later that will probably help you understand. So when going from DNA to RNA, when you have A or adenine in DNA, you're gonna see U in the RNA. So A bonds with U. When you see T or thymine in DNA, that's gonna bond with A in RNA. G is gonna bond with C and C is gonna bond with G. As you can see here, we're just replacing that thymine in RNA with uracil. But remember, when you have T on DNA, on the side of DNA, you're going to have A. So that can be tricky. Let's do some practice ones. Oh, we got two good memes here. You can look at these here. All right. So if we have this strand of DNA, what's the strand of RNA going to be? So like on this side, G is going to bond with C. C is going to bond with G. A is going to bond with U. And T is going to bond with A. So this is what it looks like. So go down the list here. See how you did. T goes with A, T goes with A, A goes with U, G's and C's are the same. So remember, every time where you would have a T, you just replace it with U or uracil. All right, translations next. This is the process where we're going to use that code of mRNA. So we just made a copy of DNA, and it has a code in it. Now we're going to use that code to make a protein. So we're on this second step here. We're on this translation step. So it goes transcription, translation. All right. So what happens is that mRNA is going to leave the nucleus and travel to a ribosome. We can see our ribosome right here. This ribosome is going to read that RNA and assemble things called amino acids. If you remember back in chapter two, we talked about how proteins are made of amino acids. These here, it says MET, VAL, and uh, ARG. These are your amino acids. This brown structure is the 
ribosome. What we're going to learn tomorrow or in chapter 13.2 is that these tRNA molecules are bringing in these amino acids, but they're going to bring in these amino acids and fit with these sequences of nucleotides found on the mRNA strand. We call three nucleotides in a row a codon. So we can see this first codon, AUG, codon 2, ACG, codon 3, GAG, codon 4, CUU. You can see each of these nucleotides that are three in a row, it's called a codon. Each codon is going to be specific to an amino acid. Proteins have many amino acids, so therefore they're going to have many codons that make up a protein. Another name for this long chain of amino acids is just known as a polypeptide. Think poly, meaning uh, many, and peptide are the bonds between amino acids. Now, this chart looks very confusing in the beginning, but don't worry. Let's do an example. This chart is called a codon chart. If you need one of these, if you're not here a day, let me know and I'll give you that chart. But this chart here is called a codon chart. You can see it has a lot of letters, and again, it looks confusing, but just hang on. Let me show you how, how we work one of these. All right, so using this codon chart, let's figure out which amino acid codes for the codon GCU. So again, GCU, the first letter is G, the second letter is C, and the last letter here is U. So ALA, that's the amino acid that codes for GCU. Let's do another one. Let's do UUU. It's one of my favorite ones to do. So U, U. U, P-H-E. That's the amino acid that codes for U-U-U, or U-U-U is the, yeah, you get the, you get the point there, sorry. Um, let's do another one, C-A-U. So C-A-U, histine, that's H-I-S. You can see we go to the first letter, C, second letter, A-U, histine. Let's do one more, A-U-G. So we went first letter A, second letter U, third letter G, M-E-T. You can see that the, we have this little triangle here. That triangle is our start codon. That's A-U-G. There is one codon that's a start codon. That's A-U-G. If you notice over here, we have three stop codons. We have a start codon, A-U-G, and three stop codons. That's U-A-A, U-A-G, and U-G-A. So just like I said, you have one start codon, which is A-U-G. It must be at the beginning of the gene and must start out the gene. And then you have three stop codons. You have UAA, UAG, and UGA. These end the gene. So you can see these different amino acids on the outside and the codons that code for them. Now, there are 20 different amino acids. Like I said, these letters that we saw on the codon chart are going to code for a specific amino acid. So let's go forward here. So you can see like ALA, that codes for alanine. ARG codes for arginine. ASN uh, codes for aspart asparagine, and so on and so forth. These letters will have, or these amino acids will have a three-letter abbreviation and a one-letter abbreviation. Ah, look at another good meme. What's a pirate's favorite amino acid? Arginine. Oh, and another good meme. It's very cold outside today. Make sure you have your code on. Ah, love it. All right, so here's my analogy. So we have this cookbook in the library, but you can't take this cookbook home because it's very special. So what you do is you find the page that you want to uh, actually use and you make a photocopy of it. That's like going from DNA to RNA and that process is known as transcription. You're making a photocopy of it. It still has all the, the information, but it's just a photocopy of the original. Now you take that photocopy home and you read the instructions to make a cake. That process is known as translation. That's going from mRNA to a protein. That mRNA is the copy, and that DNA is the actual protein. Uh, the, 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 the protein is the structure. Um, that's like the cake. I think this is the end of chapter 13.1. This is the end of the ch chapter 13.1. So this is, this is where you would trans transition to the next day for 13.2. This is the start of 13.2. This is going from gene to a protein. So um, after going through the worksheet that goes through transcription and translation, I'm going to tell you that what you saw in the worksheet is not 100% accurate, where you're always going to start with AUG and end with a, a stop codon. Um, usually there is uh, nucleotides before and after the start and stop codon. This protects the innermost portion from being damaged. I always like to make the analogy of these are like the aglets of your shoelaces where they protect the innermost part of your shoelace. And just the same thing here, you're going to protect the innermost part of this gene because that's, that's going to be what we want. We protect it with some just non-coding nucleotides. 
Now, what happens actually is that the uh, ribosome is going to attach to the mRNA strand and the mRNA is going to be read by the ribosome. What's going to happen is these tRNA molecules are going to be molecules that bring in the amino acids. The tRNA molecules are going to code uh, for the, or they're going to help code the mRNA into amino acids. So the amino acids are then going to bond together to form that protein. I like this image or this um, animation for 13.2 because it shows you what translation looks like. Now, I will tell you it's in German, but I've not found a better uh, just animation for this, what, what actually happens. So you can see that ribosome, it's bonding to the mRNA, and it's going to bring in these tRNA molecules, which have the amino acids on the other side. Now, these tRNA molecules are specific. You can see here they're going down. And it's going to have that stop code on, and it's going to pop off. That's our polypeptide. I'm going to show you this again. I should show this twice in class. So again, this is our, our this is our mRNA sequence. We're going to have a ribosome attach. That ribosome is going to start bringing in these tRNA molecules at the AUG or the start site. These tRNA molecules are going to have an amino acid on one end. As you can see, more tRNA molecules are going to start coming through here. There we go. And that amino acid chain is going to start to grow. That's your, that's your protein. Remember, proteins are made of amino acids. And at the end here, it's going to fall off. And that's going to be your protein. Now, talking about proteins, I, I'm not going to go through this analogy again. There we go. Proteins are what determine your physical characteristics. So again, your genes are going to be found on your chromosomes. Your chromosomes are made of DNA. And that's what, again, genes are made of. These genes make proteins that help make you look like who you are. So remember when we talked about the purple flowers of Mendel? These, that purple color is because of the proteins that were produced from the flower's DNA. Remember that a gene is a unit of heredity that determines some characteristic of an organism. It's just a length of DNA that's going to code for some specific trait that you're going to have, whether it's, uh, you know, how tall you are or maybe, you know, what color of flower it is. That's going to be a specific gene. Here's a really important concept here. Um, what we like to talk about with these genes and proteins is the amount and order of the amino acids. Every gene is going to have a different number of amino acids that it codes for and a different uh, a sequence of those amino acids. The amount and order will determine what the shape of the protein is. Now, the amino acids will bond together like you can see here. All these are amino acids, and they're going to start to bond together and fold on each other. How that shape of the protein or the shape of that protein is going to be determined by the sequence of amino acids. Every protein has a different <clears throat> number and a different sequence of amino acids, and that shape that it forms is going to determine its function. The analogy I actually use with this is you have 26 letters in the English alphabet. How we arrange these in a sentence determines what that sentence means. Um, some sentence makes perfect sense, but some sentences don't make sense, and some sentences you can, uh, but you can still understand. What I'm trying to get at is how you sequence those letters in the in the sentence determines what that sentence is going to say. Just like you sequence the amino acids in a certain order, which is going to determine the, the the protein. The same thing goes for the letters in a sentence. The last section here, 13.3, this is going to be talking about mutations. And mutations are any change in the nucleotide sequence of DNA. This can be a, nu a single nucleotide or a large region of the chromosome. We're going to be looking at how these mutations change the amino acid sequence of a protein. Now, how do we get mutations in our DNA? We talked about this a little bit when we talked about cancer, but basically you have these physical or chemical agents that are going to cause some mutations, such as like x-ray radiation, UV light, smoking, and there's a, there's a plethora of different things that cause mutations. But uh, if they occur in the gametes, then the offspring are going to have those mutations. Now, point mutations. Point mutations are a single nucleotide change in the DNA sequence. You can see this is the no mutations. We have ATG. You can see if we change each of these nucleotides, we get a different type of amino acid. Normally, this makes tyrosine, and sometimes a mutation will keep the same, but sometimes they'll change into a stop, and sometimes they'll change into something totally different. So what I'm trying to get at is you can see one letter was changed here. When there's one letter change, it's a single or a point mutation. The first type of point mutation is called a substitution mutation. This is where a single nucleotide is switched out. So you can see here we have T being switched out with C. So that's a substitution mutation. The next 
Uh, oh, with those substitution mutations, we have three different types. We have a missense, which changes the amino acid. So you can see no mutation. A missense changes it. So we went from a lysine to a threonine. That changes the amino acid. So we can see here, the original was TTC. The mutation was TGC. That changes lysine to threonine. A silent mutation doesn't change the amino acid. So you can see here TTC, TTT. We have lysine here. We also have lysine here. That's called a silent mutation. A nonsense mutation. This changes the amino acid to a stop codon. So again, TTC, ATC. That changes lysine to a stop codon. That's called a nonsense mutation. We also have frame shift mutations. These are mutations that change the sequence of codons. So this is a little bit more detrimental because it's not going to just change one amino acid. What happens in this frame shift is you can see we're shifting the codons. Excuse me. We start out with CAT, TCA, and then so on and so forth. If we move it just one, you can see how every single one of these is going to be shifted over. It's a frame shift. The codon sequence is changed. The first type of uh, frame shifting mutation is insertion, and that's when you just add a single nucleotide. You can see if we add a single nucleotide, it shifts everything over. And you can kind of guess the second one, it's called a deletion where you take one out and you can see here this T is being taken out. And again, it's a, it's a different type of frame, sh frame shift, but you're just removing that nucleotide and you're shifting the codons. So here when talking about mutations, we're going to see how these mutations affect the protein. So what happens is these mutations can either affect the sequence of amino acids or they can change the number of amino acids. Now, when that happens, you're going to change the protein structure. When you change the protein structure, you change its function. And sometimes that can be for the good, and sometimes that can be for the bad, or sometimes that can not really change the function at all. But basically what these mutations do is they change the structure of proteins and make them have different functions. Sometimes they lose the function, sometimes they gain a function, and sometimes they just have no change on that function. It, it, it determined, it's by, determined by um, the type of mutation and how significant it is. But basically, these mutations change the organism if it's in all of the cells. It, um, if it's in a somatic cell, it might only change that cell, um, but it can still have uh, pretty big consequences. I think this is the end of chapter 13. It is. Okay.